Mike Coyle. Today I'm here with a special guest, Robert Sin. He is the founder of the TradingLab.co. He is the most followed person on CEO.ca, and he goes by the handle at Goldfinger. If you're looking for him on Twitter, he can be found at CEO Technician. Hi, Robert. How are you today? Great, Mike. It's good to be here. It's it's kind of nice to be talking markets when there's not a whole lot going on because it's Labor Day. Yeah, I thought it'd be interesting for us to get together and maybe talk about some of the common interests we share. I know you're actively invested in CNC. You just went to uh, the New Range Gold site as we did last year. And uh, you're just getting involved with the RJK Exploration Nipissing Diamond story. So what's your take on the Nipissing Diamond so far? Uh, well, I wish I had found that diamond. Uh, you know, unfortunately, I didn't. The 800 carat diamond that was, you know, discovered uh, in the early 1900s near Cobalt. Um, it's quite an interesting story. I, I suggest people go to the company website or go to your site there's a lot of content there you know even if you're not interested in investing in the diamond sector or diamond exploration still really a very interesting story um yeah so rjx uh on the venture it, it's, it's sort of just been trapped in this range it seems like it drops down to like 16 cents and people buy it it goes up to 23 cents people sell it um even though they had great news last week by 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 my account at least i, th I think it's a very exciting story and, and it could be a big it could have a lot of upside in the next few months i know we're waiting for the assays um you know the pending assays which will obviously tell the story but uh it's very intriguing to me and from a technical vantage point you know if my downside risk is a few cents, you know, if it's at 17 and a half and it seems like it doesn't want to ever drop under, let's say 14 or 15. So that's my risk. And, you know, who knows, you know, if these assays give confirmation that they are really onto something there, um, then what could the upside be, you know, a dollar, $2, uh, you know, who knows? It seems to me like an attractive speculation. Well, on that note, I mean, with some of the past uh, diamond exploration plays have gone up multiples higher than one or two dollars. And that's where I kind of have in the back of my mind as I'm ingrained in this story, because, you know, this is in my backyard. I was at the R RJK Core Shack this weekend and I got to see the Parody Pond and we're going to put up a, a gallery of that this week so that the investors can see it too, or for the more geology minded people can kind of have a look for themselves. But we're talking about a core that's identical to what they discovered 18 micro diamonds in, in 2019. Um, so, I mean, this is just, it's coming, it's getting really interesting. And, and that's partially because there was a Merck report that was done. Uh, the Mineral Exploration Research Center in Canada did a five year uh, exploration campaign in cobalt. And that report is basically five years worth of free information that RJK is now starting to tap into. And they're starting to see some correlations with the Cross Lake Fault and the Montreal River Fault, where the con claim is on the Montreal River and the Parity Pond is on the Cross Lake Fault, but they seem to sit along a structure called the Schumann Arch. And these Kimberlites are, are they're dated right in the right place. I mean, this is a discovery and it's a story. It's a story like no other out there. I mean, there's a diamond. It's that a new decisive. discovery. Yeah. yeah. I mean, it's a new discovery. And the location of this pond mm -hmm. is very interesting, as you were just about to say. Yeah, I mean, it's it's not far from town. You're talking uh, five, six, seven kilometers from North Cobalt, uh, back in the bush. Very easy access to it. Um, you know, Cobalt's a, a mining town. We've had infrastructure here for hundreds of years and well 100 years anyways um, not to get ahead of myself but uh, this is what's really interesting is that it's so close to infrastructure it's so close to a mining friendly jurisdiction or it is in a mining friendly jurisdiction and this is a legitimate discovery now the market wants to see the big beautiful diamonds but i mean this new kimberlite that they're drilling into it's very coarse grain 
it's it's defies some of the logic behind kimberlites and how they come out of the ground and explode out of the ground there's somewhat of a running theory that maybe it ran into the underside of a glacier and spread out because this what they're finding is it's sitting on top of a granite bed with only four meters of overburden on it. I mean, in context of kimberlites, this is extremely close to surface. So when it comes time to bulk sampling, it's about the most cost-effective kimberlite that you're gonna come across. So you were talking about it trading in that range. I think it, part of that is that the market is just sitting here waiting to hear about a large diamond. And the best part is, is that the lithologies behind this kimberlite are actually leaning towards them finding type 2A diamonds. And if they are colored yellow, I mean, for perspective, green diamonds are the most valuable diamonds out there. Uh, you got, then you got your blues and your pinks and your yellows and you know, those colored diamonds, those aren't diamonds that can be made like De Beers makes right now. These are unique in the sense that they can only be found in certain Kimberlite pipes and we may very well have one. And I think there's something to be said for that. I'm far from a diamond expert, but what I do understand about diamonds is that the man-made diamond, the, the man-made diamonds are like 800 to a thousand bucks and they're just super common. And yeah, if you want a man-made diamond, go pay a thousand bucks and, you know, get one. But the, the natural real diamonds are still way more valuable and highly sought after. Um, and a new discovery, if this is one, which we don't know. We're speculating here. We're speculating here, but there's a lot of there's a lot of smoke. There's a lot of smoke. It's the right location, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and it makes sense that it's in this pond and it was uh, you know hidden for for you know for you know for so long. Um, and you know if this is a new discovery, these diamonds are going to be worth a lot. You know for for a multitude of you know reasons. And obviously, you know, we need confirmation. And, and when we do see this big, nice uh, you know, yellow diamond, as you say, then obviously the market will appreciate it. But until yeah. then, uh, there's a lot of skepticism and the diamond sector is just, it's just hated. I mean, how many publicly traded diamond companies are there? I mean, there's really, there's maybe a handful in Canada. Yeah, I, I think on my watch list, I'm watching a, a good dozen or so, and then you've got the majors. But I think that's the thing that people really need to understand here is that in a sector of diamonds that are so hated with, you know, this handful of companies that we're talking about, RJK is outperforming most of those junior exploration companies looking for diamonds. And none of them have a story with the background and the research that's all coming together the way this is. And another thing is that the majors, I mean, Rio Tinto's diamond mine in Australia, the pink diamond mine, that's closing down. De Beers, Attawapiskat, Victor Pipe, that's closed down. That's, uh, you know, these large companies are now looking for a project. And this just, if it is a discovery, and that's a big if, but everything's lining up. If this is a discovery, these companies are going to be at the forefront knocking on RJK's door going, let's talk here. I mean, these guys know what they're looking for. And when they see yeah. that information cross the wire, who knows what this could be worth? You know, it's very interesting. I mean, when I, you know, I'm a, I'm a trader first and foremost and an investor secondary, you know, when I look at something like RGK right now and whatever it is, it's like a $12 million market cap on the venture. Um, basically any exploration company that has a stock symbol on the venture that has a project that has a name, has a CEO with a pulse, gets a $10 million market cap in this bull market environment in the gold or silver sector, right? So because this is diamonds is different, but think about that 12 million with what, what could very well be a new discovery, a real discovery that definitely could be economic in a, in a great location, a uh, solid management team, tight share structure. A lot of the things that we want to see when we're looking for a new exploration company to invest in and it's it's like 12 million dollar market cap so you have all these gold and silver juniors that basically are just uh, i don't want to say pump and dumps but they're not very attractive speculations yeah. from my estimation they get 10 million dollar markets shit they some of them get 20 million yeah. right so if i look at that versus rjx I'll take my chances with RGX, and I have actually on um, the market. It's not my largest holding, but it's not it's not a small speculation on my part. And obviously, I wanted to see it 
break out last week. I wanted to see it go to 30 cents or 35 cents on that news. It didn't, but I guess we just have to wait for the assets. And I'm, I'm willing to take that gamble where I risk 10% or maybe a little bit more on, on the downside. And I'm taking a shot at a multi-bagger, you know, and obviously, yeah, it could be, it could be, it could be a huge winner. I'm going to be a little bit, you know, more conservative and say, you know, Hey, I'll, I'll take a five X or a 10 X and, and I'll be happy with that. You know, uh, I'll probably sell some at a dollar to get my cash out of it. And then I'll, I'll try to ride the rest, you know? Yeah. And that's the thing with diamonds is that if you go back in history and look at some of the, the diamond rushes that really created a lot of momentum in the market, you look at the Akadi and Diabic diamond mines and that's Dominion and Diamet. You can find it on the RJK website. They have the charts posted right there. So don't quote me, but one of the share prices went from like 26 cents to $55 the other one went from 30 something cents to $66. Now, one of those companies took 12 years to do that. And the other pipe was discovered during that time. So the other one only took two years. But I mean, this is generational wealth that can be created. So we need a little bit more evidence. We need a little bit more drilling, maybe a bulk sample. And I think this is, this is a story that's going to catch some steam and start to move. And I, I've been beating my chest about it for a year and a half talking about this, but you know, then there wasn't as much information as there is now, but the people, the people that are involved in this, I cannot stress this enough, are very, very smart people. And they have a wealth of experience that date back to the 1980s in searching for Kimberlites and diamonds on this project. And that gives me more confidence than the project itself, just because I know where they've come from. And I think, I think that's a really good point, Mike. So I, I've talked to management several times. Obviously, I'm not right there, you know, in my hometown, you know, like you are, but, but I have talked to uh, Robert a few times, uh, and he's a very likable guy, very honest, straight shooter. And you know what? They've basically self-funded this whole thing. So they have a lot of skin in the game. Most of the, the capital that's been put to work here to explore these projects has come from management, you know? So I think that 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 speaks a lot you know and, and there's warrants at 20 cents that are i think are almost entirely held by management and that might be a future source of funds uh you know when we get to that point that was a really creative deal actually they tied some uh royalties to that private placement that they ran and you're right the warrants are exercisable at 20 cents uh due i believe at the end of this year so so that's most likely going to be their next source of funding, you know, when they need it. Yeah, I would imagine. I mean, diamond exploration is a pretty expensive, um, expensive operation. It's not like gold and silver. You throw a diamond drill bit down there. Bulk samples can get expensive. But like we said earlier, we're talking about four meters of overburden on the Paradis, and the con claim only has maybe eight to eleven meters of uh, overburden there. It makes so they're it in a, a very favorable to... situation makes it a lot easier to yeah. uh, you know explore you know when you don't have to drill the 500 meters yeah so on that note we'll skip over to canada nickel i know this has got to be one of your biggest holdings you've gone very pro canada nickel the nickel market's heating up uh, things bhp's talking again you know the majors are starting to, to move and these juniors my god we got giga and cnc uh, FPX that are all doing quite well in this environment, especially after Elon Musk talk. So give us your take on Canada Nickel. The new white gold. Uh, I love nickel and I, I, I love this story. Um, it really checks all my boxes, you know, in, in, in a lot of ways. So just to give a little background, uh, I met Mark Selby for the first time in January at the VRIC in Vancouver. And although I had followed him a little bit at RNX, I wasn't really super focused on that story. So, so I didn't really know who he was and, and his level of knowledge and expertise on this sector, right? Uh, so he really impressed me. I mean, he kind of blew me away when we met in Vancouver for about an hour. This is a guy who has a wealth of knowledge about the macro factors but also the micro factors and he really knows how to be the CEO of, uh, you know, a company that's exploring uh, and moving forward. What is going to, in my estimation, going to be a mine. Uh, 
great location, um, huge, you know, footprint. They've only uh, explored maybe 10%, probably less yeah. um, of, of the property package. Um, and they continue stepping out. They keep hitting. Uh, they continue to prove up a larger uh, and higher grade uh, you know, resource. Um, so basically all the things that I look for in an exploration story, uh, this company has, and yeah, it's my largest holding right now. And, and I'm looking forward to the, you know, resource update, hopefully within a week or two, I, I know the assay lab has been backed up. A lot of exploration work is going on this summer across Canada. So, uh, there's a bit of a bottleneck and with the whole COVID thing, I think the labs are working on, on lighter staffing. Um, but I'm pretty confident that we'll get that in the next couple of weeks. And that should be, I think that should be a, a big catalyst because I think that this project is a lot bigger with a higher grade core than most people fully appreciate right now at this point in time. And the platinum and palladium that runs along the system. And platinum and palladium. Yeah. I'm glad you touched on Mark there for a moment. And he, he seems to have left the same impact on me because, you know, Mark is, and this can't be overstated. Mark is one of a handful of people that truly, honestly understand nickel sulfide deposits. You know, most nickel operations chase those high grade veins and the nickel sulfides are just, starting to come to fruition over the last 10, 20 years. It's, it, it's been, you know, you can, now people are starting to realize the value in these nickel sulfides. And to have somebody at the helm like Mark, who truly understands how to get full value out of that is, is immense. And that become, that's because of his involvement with Dumont. I mean, the guy spent seven years advancing the Dumont project, which is now the second largest uh, nickel sulfide deposit that's shovel ready in the world. But I don't think Canada Nickel's going to be very far behind because, I mean, I've been working with Noble Minerals going back a year and a half and Noble Minerals has been sitting on these highlighted nickel sulfide deposits that Inco drilled in the 1960s. Nobody's ever tapped into it, but it took a guy like Mark to look at this differently and go, hold on a second, we've got something here. And boy, do we have something here when you start factoring in the other properties. And I think an important point, like all, all of that is, is really excellent uh, to highlight. And I think the key point is that this project has a higher grade core yeah. that can make a big difference in the economics of a mine. And, and, that, and that's huge. And another thing that I came to mind is a lot of CEOs in this sector will tend to just get their, their free options, their, their free founder shares or whatever it's not free but you know cheap founder yeah. shares right and they'll just take their salary and, and they'll be happy with that and if things go well they'll do well with their options and their founder shares and stuff but selby has not only obviously gotten some some stock from being a founder of the company and obviously options being chairman and ceo but this is a guy who's put hundreds of thousands of dollars of his own money and his family's money into the stock with open market purchases and participating and participating in financing so this is a guy who's got a lot of skin in the game and uh, I think that management owns roughly 10% of the, the, the total shares. And that's not a tiny amount for the sector, especially when you're talking about a hundred million plus market cap, they've got skin in the game and they are aligned with shareholders. You know, this is a management team and a CEO who are going to see this to the end zone. They're like, they're going to score that touchdown at some point. It could be later this year. It could be next year. It could be in two years. I'm not sure when, the stars will align, but in my mind, they're in the right place at the right time with the right team. And you said that he's been opening, uh, buying in the open market. He has and at higher prices than today's trade trading price. So people should be aware of that. Um, funny thing, well, not funny thing, but interesting thing with Canada and nickel is that the Crawford nickel deposit alone, 20% of the structure has been drilled for the 11th largest. Like you said, you've got the resource update coming and they will have drilled 50% ish in that neighborhood. So, you know, the, the footprint, but they also have other properties right. that they've just acquired that they, yeah. that they're going to be putting 
complete, com you know, completely new, new exploration holes into. I mean, so there could be a new discovery coming. Absolutely. And a lot of these have been highlighted by nickel drilling, mag surveys, um, spectrometry surveys. There's been a lot of work done. Noble did a lot of the groundwork on this, uh, on this project after acquiring it. So there's a lot of information there that suggests that they have very similar um, type of, of uh, showings on the property. So Mark went ahead and he picked up five more. You got Kingsmile, Mahaffey, McDermott, uh, Aubin, and you know, these other five structures, they're not uh, well, a lot smaller or larger than Crawford. They're very similar to Crawford. One of them is eight kilometers long, though. And if they run with the platinum palladium grades that this is coming with, I mean, you're talking about that higher grade shell. That higher grade shell is so important to the early economics of a project like this that it's that's it's very important it's very important because that's cash flow in the early parts of the project and then when you yeah. factor in they can sell iron as a byproduct then they can go ahead and sell platinum and palladium as a byproduct and then and cobalt they're in cobalt and, and cobalt <laughs> which is coming up in value as well then you've got the fact that their tailings are capable of recycling the carbon or absorbing the carbon that is huge. So net zero footprint. I know a lot of people are like, yeah, whatever. But if you really truly <laughs> understand what that means, I mean, okay. So here's a little example. It would the equivalency of driving a gas powered vehicle for 50,000 kilometers is the same amount of carbon produced to manufacture one of these batteries and maybe you can give them us some insight on you know what's going on in the rest of the world and why is that significant because indonesia and china they're not producing the same way that we do well so most of the you know you know deposits in indonesia are, are coal powered right so so that and, and china too it's coal powered so huge carbon uh you know footprint and you have these, you know, like electric vehicle companies that, that want to source from environmentally friendly mines, you know, and efficient mines. So, so they're going to move away most likely from, from those sources of, of, of coal uh, powered projects to ones like, uh, you know, we have there in Ontario, right? So, um, yeah, and, and you know the electric vehicle revolution is is really taking hold, and we're just in the early stages of it. I think people really need to appreciate that we're we're still in the early early stages. Most of the the vehicles on the road by far are not EVs, right? And so, but we're starting to see that shift where more people are buying evs more people are buying evs you know and and every car manufacturer is in this arms race to get that new technology you know and, and get those products out on the road and new batteries are shifting towards more nickel hence more of a demand coming out of the electric vehicle sector right more nickel equals longer battery life and that's the simple equation like that's what you need to know as an investor and what's unique about this with this EV revolution happening is that where majors would step in and they'd want to take this project and put it into production. Now you have auto manufacturers expressing interest in maybe securing their feed for the future. I mean, Elon's come out and said that, hey, maybe we'll get into nickel mining. And it was almost half jokingly, but there's some validation to that. I mean, there's a need for this. It makes sense that Tesla would not own a mine, but they would be a, maybe a JV partner with a mining company. It, it makes sense to me because it's a win-win for both sides. The mining company needs capital and the Tesla brand name to give validation, right? And, and lower the, their cost of capital, right? To actually build out the whole project and everything, right? And Tesla needs to lock up mm -hmm. that, you know, new metal uh, coming out of the ground from an environmentally neutral and efficient source, right? So it, it makes sense. And, and as an investor in the junior mining sector, that's sort of like my, you know, before I go to bed at night, I pray, <laughs> please, let's do a deal like this. Because when that first LOI, it just needs to be a letter of intent, not a, a full contract where they're sending the 200 
uh, you know, million dollar wire to the mining company, but the letter of intent will just set the sector on fire and it will lower the cost of capital for everyone. Share prices will go up. It'll be easier to finance and just be a, a, a rising tide will lift all the boats, right? So now you have two competing factors. You've got majors and manufacturers that are now going to be looking at these projects and that's going to create value on its own. We've all seen what Elon's comments uh, most recently did to all of these nickel uh, exploration plays. It's been absolutely a fun ride to be a part of. And as this uh, progresses, I'm with you. I'm very bullish on Canada and nickel. I think it's going to be put into production. I mean, you got Kid Creek, not even two kilometers away, three kilometers away, and they can't go a whole lot deeper. They keep extending it, but they can't go a whole lot deeper. So what's nickel going to fall back on? Their aging gold mines, maybe another VMS deposit is discovered. It very well could. Um, and I hope it is. But at the end of the day, Timmins needs something like this. And what it would mean to the economy cannot be overstated. And I think that's a really important point, you know, that I want to make that these projects, these are not just pieces of paper, stocks, uh, charts with lines on them. Like this is affects the real economy and this generates jobs uh, in these locations, whether it's Cobalt or Sudbury or wherever it may be. Uh, these mines do generate jobs they help people they help the economy they generate tax revenue for the locality or for the country um and and, and i think that that's really important that people put that you know into context well thanks for your insight on cnc and rjk but i don't want to stretch this out too long so let's uh jump into um new range gold you just went there you just went to nevada i went there last year i love what i seen i thought it was super cool I got a tour through the addits. I'm not sure if you caught that video, but man, this property, there's a lot that hasn't been tapped into and, and touched, even though it's got over 300 addits on the property. There's so much more to this story. So I really enjoyed my trip out there. Um, and it was, it was a real pleasure to sort of venture out into the old West, you know, like, like when you drive on these dirt roads, um, out um, to you know the project. Uh, it's you, you see like the old skeleton of the mill, um, and you see these old addits and these rolling hills, and it, it really does make one go back to like what it must have been like in the old west, you know. And New Range is a very interesting company with this flagship project you know obviously in the you know walker lane trend and so much uh you know history there where you have uh in the 1880s it was they were pulling out 10 ounce per ton gold you know out of um you know this location and you know new range has the challenge from an investor market standpoint right now is they have these high grade hits into the epithermal veins mm -hmm. and then they're trying to tie it together with maybe some lower grade uh, you know near surface oxide gold that might be anywhere from i don't know 0.3 grams to maybe a, a gram and the market is not really getting or they're not appreciating that of, of what this could be right and so that's sort of management's challenge right now is to sort of tie it all into something that makes sense you know for, uh, from an economic standpoint well i think part of the problem with market perception of this project right now is that in 2017 these guys were hitting high grade ore and I mean, really nice stuff in the merit decline. And they were kind of drilling around that area and that got the share price running up into the 70s. Well, then they had to kind of pull back the reins a bit because as they started to drill around the old adits, what they were finding is that they were punching through the adits and losing holes. I mean, that's an expense. You don't get that back. Once you've lost the hole and lost drill rods and steel, I don't think people really understand the importance of why they stopped what they were doing and they started to do the LIDAR mapping. The LIDAR mapping gave them some perspective of what those undergrounds look like. And in doing so, they could see the flat-lying vein structures. 
they can see the near vertical shears that were also pushing that mineralization up into these oxides, if you will. They're still, they're still brecciated quartz and you can actually see right here, um, there's brecciated quartz veins that are trapped in between clay. So above it, you have clay with oxides in it. Below it, you have clay with oxides in it. And then right in between, you have this brecciated quartz um, material that holds very high grade. I fa actually found a piece while I was in Nevada in the, uh, the gold bar dumps. But getting back to my point, is that it was really important for them to understand this because as you're drilling these holes around these adits where you got high grade hits, I mean, there's 14 grams per ton in some areas or more. Um, I'd have to go and look it up to get the actual numbers. But the fact is, is there was high grade left behind. And now that they're drilling with the LIDAR mapping and understanding things, um, it's going to get a little bit more interesting, particularly when they step out into the area of the new IP survey. And we'll get into that a little bit more, but if you spoke with them about that IP and what that's gonna mean for the uh, for the project? Yeah, so the big deep IP anomaly is sort of what really has me excited right now, because I mean, obviously look, there there's gold everywhere there, but that doesn't mean that it's going to be a mine, right? Um, but the big deep IP anomaly is something that they have not gotten a, you know, rigged to yet, but hopefully they will fairly soon in the next few weeks. Um, and th that something that, that really pops out, um, you know, on this survey, you know, that you're talking about. And it makes sense that there would be a buried intrusive there, like probably sulfides that may or may not have gold in it, right? But when you think about where this is located, and what's around it, it would make sense to me just as a layman, you know, just as a, a regular dumb person, it makes sense that this, this could really host uh, quite a bit of gold at depth. And there's, it makes sense with, with, you know, when you see it, it's a sort of big hill, I wouldn't call it a mountain, but it is at elevation, you know, we're more than a mile up there. Um, it would make sense that it was not easy for the old timers to get to. Mm -hmm. uh, there, there, there is one old adit somewhere on that hill, but it, it's it's not a very good one, and they can't really use it uh, these days. But uh, and it's even kind of hard to get up to the top of that because there's not really a good road. That's something that that that, uh, that they're working on. Um, so it, it makes sense that this is sort of hiding in plain sight and that now they have this new technology that helps them to, uh, to identify that, oh, this is actually a really attractive target. Now, I'm not sure if you got the chance. Did you go back in behind Gold Bar and um, the Ridge to go into a uh, Good Hope Mine? No. So I saw three companies on a single day um, all all in, in roughly the same area, but a long drive from Las Vegas. And, and, you know, this was like the last stop of my day. So I spent about three hours on site. So when you get back to, to the top of gold bar mine and you're looking out at a good hope, if you look up the valley, like you said, there's an old adit that's up there. But what's really interesting is that whole valley from top to bottom is untouched until you get down near, um, down near um, Gold Bar, sorry. There's an old placer mining operation that's down in the valley there. And that's just kind of right in line with where uh, Gold Bar and um, Pimlico Ridge is. And it, it's kind of along that trend, but that gold came from further up the mountain where that added is. And like you say, it's pretty it's hard gravity. to get up there. Yeah, it, it had to come from a higher elevation source, a, a hard rock source, right? That's right. And so in talking to management while we were on site, we were looking at the project from Google Earth. And, you know, when you start to think of the surrounding mines, and maybe more so Round Mountain, that's an operation that's sitting on a caldera. And that got me thinking. And I wrote a, a research report on caldera complexes of Nevada and how it drives some of the mineralization within the Walker Lane trend. But even more interesting is that Round Mountain sits on the pancake liniment which is same thing with new range. So not only are you in the Walker lane, not only are you on the Pamlico or the pancake liniment trend, 
you also have a complex system of calderas that traced through this area dating back millions and millions of years ago that tie you right up to Yellowstone Park. And I don't think a lot of people understand the significance of that. And that's, this is why Nevada is the way it is. This is why you have that, that highly mineralized ground that has the one gram per ton and half gram per ton that is economic because of the driving forces behind the mineralization. So the you know, Walker Lane trend itself is obviously is, is very large. There, we're talking about, you know, like a gold endowment of 100 million ounces and God knows how much silver. I think it's like 800 million. I mean, but like probably the stuff that hasn't been found, you know, you add it all, we're talking you know, over a billion ounces of, you know, silver. So, so this is a, a huge endowment of, you know, of gold and silver on this trend. Uh, and it would make sense that there's a lot more that we haven't found yet, right? Well, if you haven't had the chance to look at the Pamlico Ridge project from Google Earth, take a look at it. Let me know what you think, because to me, it looks like a compressed caldera or collapsed caldera. I mean, I don't in my mind, there's no question about it. And there's a lot of work that needs to be done. There is nowhere near enough drilling done on the property to even suggest that that is the case. But do the research, look at the, the complexes and, and come back and look at the Google Earth image. And to me, it's, it's pretty plain as day. So new range, I'm super excited about the prospects of what they have. And it's kind of interesting. And I, you know, I think we could probably end it here, but all three companies that we've talked about, uh, at least in the recent past, they've all sort of pulled back and they're all a little bit out of favor in a sense and you have to ask yourself from, you know, from an investor standpoint, you know, do I want to buy when something, a stock is hot and it's, it's been running up a lot, or do I want to buy when things are more out of favor and pulling back in price? And I think the answer to that question, at least for me, is pretty obvious. Thanks for joining me today, Robert. Thank you. Cheers. Cheers.